everyone! Welcome to episode number 579 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. My friends, I am happy to announce that Tim Stewart, AI Tech's Director of Business Development, is joining me this week. Recorded at this year's Embedded Tech Trends Conference, Tim and I are chatting all about the ODA loop, how AI is enabling decision superiority, and the role that Project Convergence will play in the future of battlefield technologies. We also talk about Tim's Titanic Lego project. And also this week, keeping with our military theme, I check out a new autonomous submarine developed by the Australian government called the Ghost Shark. So without further ado, please welcome Tim from AI Tech. Hi, Tim. Thank you so much for joining me. I am happy to be here. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about leveraging artificial intelligence to enable decision superiority. But first, can you define decision superiority? And there's a DOD initiative on a high level here, right? Yes. So that's one of the innovations, if you will, about the presentation and the white paper that we wrote was actually defining what decision superiority is. And for practical purposes, useful purposes, we suggested, put forth the, the, the idea of using the ODA loop, the observe, orient, decide, action loop as a basis for decision superiority. Because if you're transversing the ODA loop faster and better than the, uh, the other party, you are making better decisions. So the way that we define or suggest that decision superiority be defined is how well uh, you are traversing the ODA loop. Okay, so shared intelligence is at the heart of JADC2, right? What are the biggest technological challenges you're seeing here? Well, it's an interesting question because if you look at JADC2 and it's like high level description, it starts off with a tagline of sense, make sense, and act. And that, from a high-level point of view, maps almost directly uh, to the ODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, act, sense, make sense, act. And then JADC2 takes the next step down in terms of providing you know, lines of effort as part of its description and strategy. And it's interesting as a way of answering your question about looking at those five lines of effort, because you are correct. One of them is modernizing mission partner information sharing. That's explicitly one of the five lines of effort in JADC2. But in answer to your question about what are the other technical challenges, it's interesting because those technical challenges are almost exactly listed out in the other four lines of effort, which is making the, the data enterprise to support the shared data, the human enterprise, and then the technical enterprise. And those three things form the challenges, the real you know, triad of challenges, if you will, of the, the data enterprise, the human, and then the technical aspect of the underlying challenges to partner information sharing. Okay, so let's talk more about the ODA loop. Can you talk about that process and what all it entails? Sure. Would a little bit of history on the ODA loop be useful? Sure. So the ODA loop was written by a gentleman by the name of John Boyd. John Boyd is somebody, one of these people that you probably don't know the name, but you almost certainly have known his work. Uh, not the ODA loop, perhaps, but he was also the person that created the envelope as part of the right stuff and uh, astronauts. Many of us have heard the phrase flying at the edge of the envelope. Well, it turns out the envelope is a mathematical to graphical curve that John Boyd popularized and put to uh, effort in designing aircraft. One of those aircraft that was a result of that approach was the F-16. 
So that was John Boyd. Part of his other work is this thing called the ODA loop, the Observed, Orient, Decide Action. And it sounds simple, it sounds straightforward, and it's almost trite. However, one of the things that Boyd did in establishing this was just a ton of research behind the loop. So the thing about the ODA loop is actually a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, the ODA loop, if you see the diagram, the ODA loop isn't a loop at all. It's actually a loop of loops. There is a feedback loop between each one of the steps, between observe and orient, there's a, a loop there. And then beside observe, orient, decide, act, for each step, there is a feedback loop to the previous step. And then overall, there is a, a loop so the ODA loop is actually a little bit of a misnomer in that it is actually a loop of loops, which is why it's so flexible and reflective of you know, the very dynamic fluid situation that decision making uh, actually is. Okay, let's talk about risk. How do we analyze risk in this process? So the ODA loop allows and evaluates risk by a very specific step. Observe, you see something, but you may not know it's a risk. There's something out there. Is, is it the enemy or is it livestock? And that's specifically one of the steps that John Boyd had insight into, that there is a step after you observe called orient. And orient is described as being, you know, making sense of what you see. So there's a first step, which is you see it, you, you sense it, you hear it, you feel it. And then that very specific step, the second step, is one of the key things about the ODA loop in orienting. What is it? Is it a threat? Based on your experience, you know, what is it? And then, as I said before, there's a feedback loop between each one of them. Your experience on what you've seen before may influence and provide feedback to what you're currently observing. There's something out there. It looks like livestock. Uh, in the past, that livestock has been a trap. So part of analyzing risk uh, is in that very specific orient step in the ODA loop. And then those risks that come based on, on your experience in the feedback loop are how the bottom line on how your question gets answered. How do you evaluate risk? It's part of the orient step in the ODA loop. That makes sense. So project convergence can also play an important role here when it comes to identifying use cases, right? So can you talk about a couple use cases where AI would make a difference? Yes. So project convergence has as part of it a number of use cases, uh, 12, I think there's might be 15 now, about 12. And they are very specific descriptions of what a group of a military organization you know, does. And they are the typical things you would expect and some that you wouldn't expect. When we started off this work, we hired a uh, consultant that was a, a variance to army officer to help us pick the use cases that we would first start off with. Because starting off with 12 was just too many. We wanted to start off with three. And we hired a consultant to help us pick and then you know, work through the use cases from like the user's point of view, if you will. He did that, and the use cases out of the 12 were two that you wouldn't expect as a top priority, and a third that you would. The one that you would expect out of such a, a list is armed AI attack, which is exactly like it sounds. It is combat, using AI to assist in that. Armed AI attack. And the applicability of AI in that regard is uh, manifest. You pick off targets, you classify targets, whether or not they're targets at all, uh, and then you provide guidance recommendations on whether or not uh, you engage them. Uh, so straightforward from that regard. But again, that's the one that you kind of expect. The two that we didn't expect for him to pick as high priorities were resupply, and the third one was uh, wet gap crossing. And it turns out those two that you wouldn't expect turned out to be very important, although not obvious, to the functioning of a military unit. A major consideration, like a top consideration, as I said, one of the top three that he picked out of the 12. 
So resupply covers everything that the, the unit would need, the obvious ones being ammunition. But the other ones not so obvious are spare parts, food, water, and all the basics. You know, all the things that, you know, not just a, a fighting group would need, not just what a, any group of people would need, but a fighting group. Right. All that has to be part of the resupply. And AI can help in terms of the coordinating, the logistics, you know, the when, the where. And the third one was the WebGAT crossing in terms of the, the priority. And as I mentioned during my presentation, that is, turns out to be a very difficult thing to do with a military unit. One is it's just like physically difficult to get across a river. And during that time, you're exposed and you're vulnerable. So AI can help in that regard in terms of coordination between the unit, who goes across first, who goes across in the middle, who goes across last. Um, because how you do that, you don't want to send all the shooters across and then be on the other side without any protection. You don't want to send all the, all the supplies across and then be left on the other side without any if something happens. So AI can help, again, with the coordination and the, the communication of those efforts to make a coordinated and safe crossing. So what we did at AI Tech with those three use cases and, again, working with the consultant, was that you know, having identified the cases, we went through each one and said, here is the scenario. Here's the use case without AI. And then we went through the exercise of saying, here is the difference you know, with AI for this specific use case. So that's part of the white paper that we did for GV sets, where we laid out those things. At AI Tech, we're very aware of the fact that we're technologists. We are not war fighters. And that was part of the effort to bridge the gap between this great technology that we have, what it means to the war fighter, is doing those use cases side by side. And as I talked about in my presentation, the example of the, the use cases, we were fortunate that Project Convergence had such great places to start. But as a general concept, Having very specific use case to evaluate the application of technology, not just AI, any technology, that in this specific use case, detailed, what's the difference? What difference does the technology make with it and without it for this use case? That's excellent. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me about this, Tim. Uh, before I let you go, though, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, I normally ask questions about food, but earlier you mentioned that you're in the process of building a Titanic Lego set. So tell me about this, and have you done other very large Lego sets? Actually, the answer to that question is no. <laughs> I uh, got the Titanic as a gift at Christmas time. Uh, Lego has several large kits, but the Titanic is one of the largest. At what time it was the largest, and it's certainly one of the most complicated. So it has a little over 9,000 pieces. It's, I think, 56 inches long, and I started at uh, Christmas time, and I'll finish up this weekend. Wow. Uh, so, but it's an interesting exercise in terms of the steps you have to go through and in terms of uh, orientation of parts. It's been an interesting exercise. I've learned a lot about myself in terms of you know, sticking to the process that I've established. And it's been a good exercise. It's, I'm not sure I'm going to build a, another big one, at least not in the, the near future. But <laughs> it's been fun. It's been very educational. I love it. That is fantastic. Well, Tim, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Great. Pleasure. Have you heard about The Ghost Shark? No, it is not a new Netflix film, but it sure does sound like it, right? <laughs> no, it's a new autonomous undersea vehicle developed by the Australian government within its robotic submarine program. So this new craft, which was rolled out ahead of schedule, was developed by the Australian Defence Department, Anduril Australia, and 10 different industry partners as part of the Advanced Strategic Capabilities Accelerator. The goal of this project is to build or acquire subsea warfare capabilities, which includes new autonomous and uncrewed underwater vehicles. 
So the ghost shark, which honestly looks a lot like a big bullet bill from the Mario franchise, yeah, is smaller than a conventional submarine because it doesn't need room for life support equipment for the crew, the complex sound deadening equipment needed to muffle the noise of the submariners moving about, or a pressure proof hull to keep the submarine crew safe. Instead, all of the electronics and machinery in the Ghost Shark are kept in watertight modules. When it's finally deployed, the Ghost Shark will allow the Royal Australian Navy to carry out stealthy, long-range, autonomous undersea warfare with persistent intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and strike capabilities. So I don't know about you, but I have been intrigued by submarines for a while, probably since I saw the hunt for Red October many years ago. So if you want even more information about the ghost shark or about AI tech, JADC2, or how AI tech is leveraging artificial intelligence to enable decision superiority, I've included a bunch of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I completely understand. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And, of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some super exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or hack you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of April 26th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>